Today we will discuss uh, obesity and anesthesia. Uh, this is my introduction. I am Dr. Ghulam Abhi Mehman, Professor of Department of Anesthesia, Critical Care and Pain Management Center, Bilal Medical College, Jacob University of Medical and Health Sciences, John Shore. Uh, we will discuss under certain headings and uh, uh, after completing some topics, we will give time for question and answer. So, we will discuss definition of obesity, epidemiology of obesity, measuring obesity, types of obesity, adipose tissue as organ, metabolic syndrome, clinical manifestation of obesity, body weight and obesity, anesthesia management related to anesthesia drugs, preoperative assessment, intraoperative management, postoperative care, and clinical parts. Meaning of word obesity. Word obesity is derived from Latin word obesus, which means fat. The WHO defines obesity as abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that may impair health. Next, epidemiology of obesity. Obesity can be defined nowadays as a pandemic. This is the global issue. We can see the epidemiology in 2008, 1.63 billion people were obese. And the global obesity rate was 23.9. In 2016, 1.9 billion adults were obese, overweight, and of these 650 were 650 million were obese. Uh, in 2022, 2.5 billion adults were overweight. Of these, 890 million were obese. After one year, 3. Point, means in 2023, 3.12 billion people are obese, which is 39 percent of the world population. Expected obesity in 2035, 79% adults will be overweight and obese, living in the low and middle income countries, LMICS. 88% children in 2035 will be overweight and obese, living in the low and middle income countries. Next. This slide shows uh, the rise in the number of obese people. And uh, you can see since 1975, the obesity has tripled from, in 19, from 1975. Obesity has been tripled. This is the next slide. Uh, this is uh, WHO and European region. Over 50% of people are overweight and obese. Over 20% people are obese. And this is 2013 statistics. From 1975 to 2016, the rise of obesity is 1 into 10. 10 times the rise in this. It's uh, uh, around 41 years. In 1975, 1975, one person are obese, and in 20, 2016, 10 people are obese. So it is a 1 is to 10 ratio. This is and these are uh, in 2016, 124 million people compared to 1975, which is 11 million. It's 10 times higher. Next slide. Mearing obesity. How we measure obesity? Body mass index is the most widely used tool to measure obesity. And this tool was devised by a Belgian scientist. He was a biostatistician also, Adolf Kutel, in 1830. And this BMI tool has several limitations. Number one is it does not fit in some ethnic groups of athletic, athletic build. 
second limitation is BMI does not describe distribution of it. It could be apple and pear distribution. And the third is BMI cannot discriminate in muscle tissue or fat tissue. The Mr. World or Mr. Universe or Arnold Schwarzenegger, the BMI tool will identify him as a morbid obese. So this is the limitation, three limitations. The second uh, tool, which is used nowadays even, is Brokaw's index. It was developed by a, a scientist, Perry Paul Brokaw, in 1871. Uh, the it can be calculated as height in centimeters, like me, my height is 178, so minus 100. So, height in centimeter minus 100. So, if I am 178, if I minus 100, that means my ideal weight is 78 kg. In female, it is 105. However, worldwide, BMI is used widely because it requires minimum equipment and expertise. And there are calculators which can, you can use from your mobile easily, just know the height and weight. The next slide. This is WHO classification of obesity uh, in which normal obesity is from 18.5% to 24.9, which is average. Overweight is from 25 to 29.9 near 30. Mild obesity, which is disease now, is class 1 from 30 to 30, 34, you can say 35. This is moderate. Moderate obesity class 2 is 35 to 40, which is class 2. Class 3 obesity is more than 40. It's very severe. There are other classifications in which we can identify these people as a super obese, super super obese, or morbid obese. Class three is also morbid obese. Next slide. Now, types of obesity. Types of obesity depends on the distribution of weight. It could be apple shape or pear shape. Apple shape is android distribution, means like female, male. And it describes central obesity, abdominal fat. Pear shape is usually seen in gyne gynecoid pelvis. And this is benign and peripheral type of obesity. It usually occurs in female. Measurement of waist circumference of more than 88 centimeter women and 102 centimeter men identifies individual, individuals with intra-abdominal fat and associated with higher risk. Next slide. Now we'll discuss types of obesity. You can see in this slide, very good slide, uh, retrieved from Google search. It's apple like male and female, females like uh, peer. Next, adipose tissue as an organ. Hepatic and abdominal, abdominal vein is metabolically active and should be considered as an endocrine organ. It's known as it's known to excrete more than twenty chemical mediators. The observed effects are pro-inflammatory, means release of cytokines and adipsin. Procoagulant effect, plasmogen activator, plasminogen activator inhibitor, and endocrine leptin resistant and adenopectin are released from these, these fatty tissues. Now, some point related to obesity is hunger hormone, which is known as a ghrelin. Ghrelin is produced by, from the stomach, mostly from the fundus. And uh, in uh, salive gastrectomy, we remove the 75% of the stomach, including fundus. So there are two things to occur. 
One is decrease in space for storing food. The patient cannot take more food because there is no space to store. The second is the hunger hormone level are decreased, so the patient lose weight. Uh, metabolic syndrome. Next slide. Metabolic syndrome is applied to the pattern of atherosclerotic disease and diabetes with the presence of at least three of the following. There are five variables. If three are present, this is metabolic syndrome. And it can occur in class one even. It can occur in class one even, class two, class three. It's bound to occur in class three, two and three. Uh, these are visceral obesity. Of course, this person is obese. And visceral means usually male, central obesity. They are hypertensive usually. Hyperglycemia because of insulin resistance. The cholesterol levels are raised, low HDL level. Uh, because HDL uh, has uh, indirect relation with the uh, ischemia or infarction. For example, if your level is more than 60, you are resistant to MI. So these levels are reduced. Uh, they say the good fate and bad fate. It's important to identify the syndrome and optimize each component before surgery to reduce it. In elective cases, we do this. Now, as another factor which exacerbates the condition is smoking. Smoking should be stopped for maybe two weeks or one month at least, or two months better if you have time for elective surgery. Smoking is a powerful catalyst to the development of adverse atherosclerotic events in metabolic syndrome. And if we cannot stop smoking at least 48 hours, 24 hours to get rid of carbon monoxide poisoning, we, we have a better results. Now, next slide. This is a clinical, clinical criteria for diagnosing metabolism. Same five things we have to do. We have to look for. Criteria number one is abdominal obesity. Where circumference as I discussed before, 102 and 88 in women. 102 centimeter in men and 88 centimeter in women. Triglyceride more than 150 milligrams per deciliter. High density depopulated less than 40. In men and less than 50 in female. Blood pressure, which is of course always high, more than this figure which is 130.85. And fasting blood sugar, 110 milligram, more than 110 milligram. Three of the five area must be made. In my practice, almost all five are present in, all, all five are present in class two and class three, even in class one. Next slide. Now we'll discuss the clinical manifestation of obesity. Uh, Dr. Saleh, can we uh, give time for uh, question answer or we'll go at the end? Because this is another most important point we will discuss. What are the clinical manifestations in the systems of the body? Hello, Dr. Saleh, Mohammed. Okay, we'll continue. Uh, I think it was, it was uh, muted. Yes, I understand, but if you want to have give them time for question answer, or we go answer, question answer at the end. Uh, please go through this, uh, and then in the end, I think it will be better. Okay, we'll go to the clinical manifestation of obesity. Uh, in this, we will discuss the most important point is airway manifestation. And you all know airway problem is the biggest problem for NSRS. Then respiratory manifestation in obese, after to sleep apnea, stop being sport in relation to obesity, cardiovascular, liver and biliary system, gastrointestinal system, thromboembolic event, metabolic dysfunction and body water. In airway, Airway manifestation in obese. Airway in obese patient is likely to be difficult. Studies show 
there are higher chances of uh, losing the airway during induction of anesthesia. So we must be careful. And obesity results in progressive airway infiltration by adipose tissue, causing decrease in airway diameter. A decrease of 50% or more can be encountered in obesity or morbid obesity people. Thoracic hump in obese significantly affects supine posture, resulting in extension of neck and flexion at cervical 1 and cervical 2 joint. Increased neck circumference. This is another reason for difficult intubation. This increases the difficulty. Large abdominal, abdominal head, which pushes the diaphragm upward, kephalar, and there is uh, atelic cases. We will discuss in detail. FRC, closing capacity goes higher than FRC. And during even normal tidal breathing for pre-oxygenation, the saturation is, goes down. So we'll discuss in detail in management. What is the solution? The solution is ramping position at the time of induction, which is little semi-upright position. And we'll, I'll show you in the next slide the diagram. And what we have to do, place the patient in reverse trend lumbar position with the tragus of the ear level with the manubrium sternum. This is the diagram showing the ramping position. Easily extension of the neck. If the female, the breasts go down, because sometimes breasts, if there are a big breast, they come on the jaw and difficult to do. So this position helps. And there is a, a Oxford uh, made one bed, which is ramp, which causes, this, which makes this position easy. And airway adjoints used in obese, oral and nasopharyngeal airway should be in use. CPAP should be used during pre-oxygenation. As I discussed, okay, there is a increase in closing capacity, higher than FRC, and on normal ventilation, when the patient is awake, there is fall in PAO2, or desaturation. So CPAP, maybe small, helps. PEEP during face mask ventilation, when we give our induction, patient is paralyzed, we should include the PEEP 5 or 10 to help us to recruitment. We say this recruitment manual is alveolar. alveolar. And keep the airway open. Supraglottic airway device used in obese patients should be limited to airway rescue. Uh, the authorities do not recommend the use of supraglottic airway or what we say LMA for spontaneous breathing or even for control ventilation. We can do control on LMA in obese patients. Very difficult to ventilate. They need higher pressure. They need definite airway. But if we fail to intubate, according to guideline, we should uh, we can use the supraglottic airway device, the LMA or IGL or whatever, they should be available all the time in obese patient. The standard laryngoscope remains the default equipment for intubation. Short handle blades can be useful if there is a large chest or fixed neck posture which limits the space. Video laryngoscopes are of great help. In difficult Definite difficult airway, when you know this is difficult, we should use fiber optic group, fiber optic intubation, in awake intubation. We should not go for paralysis. Second manifestation is respiratory system manifestation. Fade deposition around the chest wall and brace leads to decrease in chest wall compliance and damping of the chest expansion. Abdominal fat deposition and increased intra-abdominal pressure with peribronchial and parenchymal fatty infiltration further exacerbate this condition. You see there is a big abdominal mass of fat inside the abdomen which pushes the diaphragm upward, which, 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 which makes problem for breathing. Respiratory muscle demonstrate fatty infiltration resulting in diminished muscle power and respiratory endurance. 
इस पैरामीट्रिक चेंजेस तो ओबेसिटी सिग्निफिकेंट डिक्रीज इन एफआरसी वाइटल कैपेसिटी इंस्पायरेटिक कैपेसिटी एंड टोटल लंग कैपेसिटी क्लोजिंग कैपेसिटी एक्सीड्स एफआरसी रिजल्टिंग इन अल्वेलर कोलेस एंड डेवलपमेंट ऑफ शन एंड ए फॉल इन पीओ दिस दिस सेड विल नॉट रिस्पोंड टू ऑक्सीजन थेरेपी बिकॉज़ दिस इज अ शन अल्वेलर क्लोज and there is no air going to the alveoli and we can this cannot this is not hypoxia hypoxia so it will not improve by increasing a 5 or 200 percent even pulmonary manifestation of obesity in the lung inside decreased chest wall compliance lung compliance may be normal lung is a normal tissue in this patient this is a restricted lung disease there is a big chest wall patient is unable to breathe abdominal fat which is the diaphragm upward decrease in frc due to supine position general lumbar position and general anesthesia induction normally frc after 45 closing capacity comes near or higher to frc and in old people it's always higher than uh, frc and in obese definitely there is increasing in the closing capacity which is always higher it means normal breathing they are hypoxic alveolar atelectasis when frc exceeds closing capacity ventilation perfusion mismatch occurs leading to arterial hypoxemia and hypercarbia and pulmonary hypertension the main cause of pulmonary hypertension are hypoxia and hypercarbia and in these cases there is Uh, chronic hypoxia hypoxemia and hypercarbia which causes pulmonary hypertension and then big pressure on the right heart uh, causing left ventricular hypertrophy these are cardiovascular changes we will discuss in cardiovascular system effect of vmi on lung volumes mechanics and gas exchange force expiratory volume one in one second decreases but if we we when an if we we see ratio is preserved BMR is double causing increased oxygen consumption and more carbon dioxide production work of breathing increases the energy cost of maintaining adequate blood ventilation increases due to decrease in tidal volume and rapid shallow breathing the elastic load increases this reflects both the decreased elasticity of the chest wall and tidal ventilation occurring at lower lung volumes in the lower airway there is narrowing of the small conducting airway after to sleep apnea this is also the commonly asked question in exam uh, after to sleep apnea or are stop being these are these questions are asked in fc based to viva snoring occurs as a result of a soft tissue vibration and turbulent of air flow which causes collapse of the upper airway Snoring becomes abnormal when associated with apnea. To produce after to sleep apnea, after to sleep apnea occurs in up to 60% of obese individuals. After to sleep apnea causes hypoxemia, hypercarbia. This is a sequence of events: OSA, apnea, hypoxemia, hypercarbia. Then sympathetic stimulation and doing pulmonary. hypertension causing weak pressure on right ventricle right ventricular hypertrophy and in system systemic hypertension left ventricular hypertrophy myocardial ischemia myocardial failure strokes and sudden cardiac death a patient with osa is at increased risk of descent emergency tracheal reintubation and recovery delirium cardiac arrhythmias and planned icu admission and increased duration of hospital stay symptoms of obstructive sleep sleep apnea syndrome snoring occurs usually there are night sweats restless and during sleep because of the hypoxia as you all know sudden awakening with a sensation of gasping and choking This is again because of hypoxia, hypercarbia, airway obstruction. 
difficulty in getting up in the morning. He's very tired. Obese patient feels tired all the day. And they try to sleep in the daytime. When they're sitting in your office, in front of you, he will sleep. And depending on the grade of obesity, and day, somn- day somnolence. And dry mouth and sore throat on awakening because they are mouth breather. They open their mouth and breathe from the mouth in the whole night. Mouth and nose, they both use both uh, ways. And there, there is dry mouth and sore throat. Headache in the morning, same because of hypoxia, whether or not in the brain. And this is maybe uh, raised ICP. Forgetfulness, trouble concentrating. They are unable to concentrate on the issues. Depression, irritability, and sexual dysfunction also. Pre-operative complication which can occur in the OSA after the sleep apnea syndrome cases are difficulty intubation, number one, heat induction, hypoxia, arrhythmias, hypertension, myocardial infarction, pulmonary edema, stroke, upper airway obstruction because these all can occur from induction to the recovery. Now, stop bang score. This is again asked in the exam. Stop bang. What is a stop bang? Stop bang score is a tool of simple screening questionnaire to identify the presence of predictive factors in those with ASA. A stop bang questionnaire has a greater sensitivity than a specificity. A specificity can be improved with measurement of plasma bicarbonate levels. High star bank scores are the presence of risk factor, large neck, high melampathy score, or oxygen saturation of less than 85, and room air will require referral to sleep study, sleep study clinic before electrosurgery for a further investigation and management. This we see in, in the pre-op assessment clinic. Uh, according to history, examination, and labs, we can send them for optimization and preparation. This is a diagram showing the uh, stop bang. Stop, S means snoring, T means tired, O means observed by person who is sleeping in the same room and can listen the snoring even if out of the door. Blood pressure higher. BMI greater than 35 kg per meter square. Age occupation may be more than 50. And neck circumference more than 40 centimeters. Gender is usually male. And this is the Sleep Medicine Institute, OYO, Center for Sleep Medicine Excellence. And this is their uh, chart questionnaire. So uh, this is there are they ask eight questions. And the answer is yes or no. If the patient has from five to eight, yes, means he is high risk. If he is uh, three to four years, that means he is intermediate risk. If he is zero to two, he is low risk for OEC. Now, cardiovascular manifestation in obese. Oxygen demand increases in proportion to increase in fat free mass. This is muscle. If the muscle tissue increase, they need more oxygen. And obese have higher muscle tissue. Muscle tissue is fat. Fat and muscle both are increased. Blood volume to body total body water ratio decreases from 70 ml to 40 ml per kg at BMI 70 kg per meter square. Normally we have 70 ml per kg blood volume, which becomes in 70 kg 5 liters. But if the patient is 100 kg, even the, it is less than 5 kg, 5 liters blood in the 100 kg patient. And 70 kg, it occurs usually. So the, the, the total body water ratio to blood volume is decreased. Cardiac output increases to VMI. Heart may exhibit a number of pathological changes related to other primary obesity, as we discussed, um, back pressure on the right ventricle and left ventricle causes LVH and uh, or with heart changes occur because of obesity or because of the comar. Comar means hypertension, heart changes secondary to hypertension, cardiac changes due to diabetes mellitus, hyperlipidemia or sleep. 
vascular diseases associated with hyperlipidemia, diabetes mellitus, coronary artery disease, myocardial infarction, etc. Hypertension is associated with left ventricular hypertrophy and failure. Arterial disease is an independent factor, risk factor for stroke development. Cardiovascular manifestation. Persistent hypoxia and hypercarbia leads to pulmonary vasoconstriction and pulmonary hypertension, leading to right ventricular hypertrophy and carbon. Heart failure due to lung failure. In chronic cases, why ventricular failure can occur? ECG changes observed in obese patients are atrial fibrillation, most common, arrhythmia, left axis deviation because of the big size of the heart, voltage magnitude vary, and QRS size is not reliable. Conduction abnormalities are common. PR interval and QR interval prolongation is common and may be benign. QTC prolongation occur, appears to have a negative prognostic value. This is a diagram. Next. This is a diagram showing the cardiovascular changes, the size of the heart, left and right ventricle. Both are increased. This is, you can see, globular heart. Both uh, right and left ventricle are increased in size. Hepatobiliary manifestation, there is fatty infiltration of the liver, abnormal liver function, abnormal cholesterol metabolism and gallstone formation. In the past, volatile anesthetic agent defluorinated to greater extent causing halothane hepatitis. Nowadays, it is not used. Uh, gastrointestinal manifestation, delayed gastric emptying, gastric esophageal reflex and hiatus hernia development. There's high chances of acid aspiration in this. We should be careful during infection. There's a close relationship between liver fate and insulin resistance. Insulin resistance contributes to dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, and eventually pancreatic islet cells burn out. non alcoholic steatohepatic NASH are higher grades of non alcoholic fatty liver disease, neflate, appear to uniformity precedes NIDDM. Data suggests that 20% of patients with NASH will progress to cirrhosis. Neflate is associated with the accelerated atherogenesis and ischemic heart disease. Intra abdominal pressure increases with increasing BMI, resulting in increase. The resting intra abdominal pressure is usually around twice the normal, a 10 millimeter. Normal is 0 to 5, and the normal resting pressure of an obese, even class 2 or class 3, is 10. And, and of course, it has its own. Complication bracing on the inferior vena cava and every organ perfusion it affects the perfusion. And if it increases more than I think 20 to 25, it can cause compartment syndrome. Thromboembolic events DVT risk due to increased intraabdominal pressure, as I discussed, that the pressure on the inferior vena cava, there is a status in the lower limbs. There is a hypoxia, chronic hypoxia, leading to polycythemia, which is another factor causing the increase in viscosity and can cause thrombo thromboembolic event. It stresses and increased pressure in deep veins. Immobilization and stress. Obese patients don't want to walk, don't want to work, don't want to move. They try to relax and sit down. This is another factor of increasing the risk for DVT. Metabolic dysfunction, type 2 diabetes mellitus always occurs, increased resistance to insulin, hyperinsulinemia, abnormal cholesterol metabolism, hypercholesteremia, and polylithia system occur. People, I saw these cases, and our studies and our evidence suggest that incidence of uh, polylithia is more common. As we remember in our days, female, fail, fertile, 40. So, fate. They are usually fed. They come for polycystic. And nowadays, the bariatric surgery, everybody is coming for sleep gastric tummy or pain, ligation, and do and why operations. And uh, this has evolved in a new specialty of bariatric surgery, bariatric anesthesia. Now, body weight and obesity. 
Now we use different different calculations for dosing of the drugs. Different weights used for different dosing in obese patients. Total body weight is the actual weight measured in the uh, machine, weighing machine. This is total body weight. Ideal body weight is that with normal ratio of fat to lean body mass. This is ideal body weight. And lean body mass means total body weight minus fat or mus muscular weight. Adjusted body weight uh, practice amongst bariatric specialists support those in may many drugs according to lean body weight or adjustable body weight. In clinical practice, we target induction on the loss of eyelash reflexes. Uh, the dose is not fixed in obese patients. We have to titrate the dose as we are doing. In healthy patient, ASA1, good cases, we can calculate according to body weight. But in obesity, we titrate the dose and uh, give sleep dose of induction agent. Uh, obesity related increase in cardiac output and blood volume will alter plasma concentration of the drug and drug clearance and the half life of many agents. Hepatic blood flow and glucuronidation rate increases in obesity. Renal tubular reabsorption decreases the glomerular filtration rate. Anesthesia pharmacology in obese. When we are giving anesthesia to the obese patient, we should take care of intravenous anesthetic agent. We should we have concern for volatile anesthetic agent. We have concern with the neuromuscular blocking agent. We will discuss first intravenous anesthetic agent. Next. Uh, intravenous anesthetic agent, due to changes in blood volume and cardiac output, and IV induction dose based on lean body weight is likely to achieve lower peak concentration and a faster rate of decay. It is less likely to reach effective anesthetic brain concentration and will have a shorter duration of effect. Our induction is commonly used induction agent propofol already have a short half-life. This may explain the increased incidence of awareness in obesity girls that was revealed in the UK from the National Audit 5. Using short the solution is using short-acting amnesic drugs or co-induction can solve the problem. Using small doses of uh, metazolam, using small doses of ketamine can help in these patients. Maybe quarter milligram per kg ketamine or ketofol can be used. And uh, there are different ways to manage this patient uh, problem of awareness. And of course, these are amnesic drugs. An induction dose depend on an, an, an induction dose based on lean body weight is ideal. If a delay in achieving maintenance of an incision is encountered, then further boluses should be administered to prevent accidental awareness. As a clinician, clinician we we can manage according to situation. The dose is not fixed. You cannot fix the dose of any induction. We titrate the dose according to uh, clinical. Uh, response like eye dash reflexes and if we think the patient is having le uh, minimum dose or less dose we can give another top ups to maintain anesthesia or using the inhalation anesthetic agent from starting high doses test of anesthesia monitoring is advocated uh, in cases when there is uh, high chances of awareness. Target control infusions. Uh, there is controversy around the targeted control infusion models. The MARS model does not accept weight greater than 150 kg. This is the problem with MARS. Schneider model don't use BMI more than 35 per women and more than 42 per men. Use of these models may result in awareness or overdose. They can uh, overwork or underwork. If there's anesthesia monitoring, we use advocate when we use TCI target control, targeted control infusion of intravenous anesthetic agent. Usually, propofol is used. Uh, now, the second is concerned with the inhalation anesthetic. So, 
So we are lucky to have the modern anesthetic agent, modern anesthetic agent, like uh, uh, isoflurane, desflurane, sevoflurane, uh, very good with fast onset and offset time. Washing and wash out is quick, providing early return of airway reflexes. Uh, so nowadays, I think this is not a big concern about volatile anesthetic. And the, in the olden days, there was concern about halothian toxicity, halothian hepatotoxicity, and enfluorine for uh, fluor, higher fluoride levels. Volatile anesthetic agents are stored in liver and for the body fat for longer times after completion of surgery. But the drug concentration of brain and lungs is decreased of patients is awake fully, and uh, there's no problem in maintaining the airway and consciousness. Neuromuscular block in the third drug, third group of drug that we are using, uh, it has some concern we'll discuss. Number one is depolarizing agent, succinyl, can be used to facilitate tracheal intubation with ARAs. We have a big risk of and if so the chart acting there are high chances of difficult airway. So to be on safe side, succinal can be used. Succinamithonum fasciculation will increase oxygen consumption. This is again a, a theoretical concern. Morbidly obese patients have increased pseudocolonial security and a larger immediate distribution time, distribution volume. Dosing based on one milligram per kg total body will provide better intubation condition. non depolarizing muscle are highly ionized, less lipid soluble. This limits their distribution to extracellular fluid space. They live in the extra, which is smaller. Dosing on total body will lead to prolonged duration of it. If the patient is 100 kg, we cannot give a guardian to total body weight. We have to uh, use the lean body weight for dosing. So gamma uh, provides the ability to rapidly reverse opronium and vapronium uh, until a return of full neuromuscular function. Availability of gamma has increased the use of non deep rising muscle Data suggests that a dose based on actual body weight is acceptable. Uh, I will comment on personal, I have personal comment on this uh, Sugama Dates because I was working in Saudi Arabia for maybe 13, 14 years. Sugama Dates was available and it was very costly. I think 180 pounds in those days, 182. But the availability make us brave to use the Ropronium for induction agent, 1.2 milligram or 1 milligram per kg. And it was caused in 60 seconds to 90 seconds like final polling. And the drugs was, the, the, the Sugamadex was in hand and ready near to the trolley. And, uh, but we always do the pre-operative assessment for airway. And it was uh, easy to manage. Most of the time, it never happened to me in my life. I, I, I used the 8 ampule for 10 ampule for reversing the Ropronium immediately after intubation when I failed to do it. Uh, one time it happened and uh, I was using sucomodates in a sick patient, obese patient, one ampule was enough to reverse 200 milligram, is easy to use at the end of surgery and then uh, using in sick patient, septic patient, high risk patient where we don't want any residual neuromuscular block. Uh, and now the last word of uh, using the neuromuscular blocking drugs is when there is a difficult airway, please don't use any neuromuscular blocking drug. There is another school of thought which says, I have a friend which says that muscle doesn't help to intubation. Yes, but if you have definite difficult airway, please use awake fiber optic. Pre-operative consideration, pre-operative consideration in obese patients are same, taking history, duration of obesity, comorbids, previous operation, NSCR, medication problems, 
like routine, we examine in detail, especially airway assessment. There are high chances of difficult intubation, and we go for further optic intubation. Temporal mandibular joint limited mobility, Atlanta hospital limited mobility, narrow upper way, distance between mandible and sternum, large brace, these are all factors which can culminate in difficult intubation. Investigation we do in detail, full blood counts, urine analysis, LFTs, RFTs, renal function tests, ECG, X-ray tests, ABGs, baseline EPG, ABG must be done, baseline ECO must be done, risk assessment as a routine, especially for acid aspiration. Pre-medication we must use H2 receptor antagonist. We can use sodium citrate. We should use metoclopramide for gastric campaign as a gastrokinetic. And we must uh, do the DVT prophylaxis in these patients, which could be pharmacological or non-pharmacological. We should not use the long-acting opiates uh, to avoid the respiratory depression. Intramuscular injection are unreliable. Intravenous and intra-arterial line is comparatively difficult. When I use uh, ASA-3 or uh, morbidly obese patient, I always put arterial line because very difficult to... In Saudi Arabia, we have a chance, very good cuff, big cuffs we can use. But uh, I was happy to use intra-arterial monitoring. It helps us. Uh, regional anesthesia. Regional anesthesia is better choice for obese patient. There are technical difficulties in these patients because of obesity. Ultrasound guidance has solved the problem to some extent, but still there are problems which include obscure landmarks, difficult positioning, extensive layer of attitude tissue. We need long needles. We need sometimes the curved linear, I mean, the curved probe to, because the depth is increased in these cases. Intraoperative care, we should take care of induction. The all care, most of the care, is related to pre-operative preparation. Preparing the comorbid, assessing the difficult airway, DVT prophylaxis, acid aspiration prophylaxis, they should be worked in fully details. And in the intraoperative period, we should be ready for the concern related to induction and maintenance of anesthesia. So the first induction, first concern in intraoperative is induction. RAM position maximizes the lung function and FRC can decrease up to 40-50%. Increase apnea to desaturation time, facilitates fast ventilation and assist into it. These are the problem at induction. And RAM, RAM position is the solution to these, uh, these problems. And uh, tidal volume should be based on ideal body weight and should be 6 to 8 milliliters per kg. Recruit many many words as we already discussed. CPAP during spontaneous ventilation and PEEP during controlled ventilation, mask ventilation, and even on, after intubation we can use PEEP. Pre-oxygen is uh, very important, and we should take three to five minutes, hundred percent oxygen. This is very important. Denitrogenation. We should do denitrogenation. I say denitrogenation. Pre-oxygenation uh, is a good term, but I use denitrogenation. Induction and intubation, we use PEEP with mass ventilation, with RSI. Intubation may be difficult. Rapid desaturation occurs due to induction apnea. Desaturation occurs decrease, decrease FRC, lying supine, increase intravenous in pressure, atelectasis due to closing cell capacity higher than FRC. And again and again, uh, emphasizing on this issue of closing capacity, which is higher than FRC in, in, in normal setting, even normal supine position. Position of the patient, lithotomy, trend in position, corrosion, prone position, worsen the situation. After induction, even. Nemopolitonium worsens the respiratory function. Unfortunately, most of the obese patients come for bariatric surgery and we cannot help ourselves. So we try to manage, and um, there are different ways we use. We use lower pressures, but you see they are thick people, they have limited space. 
the pressure is always more than 12 15 normally you surgeon keeps 15 but they are not happy with 15 but i will say one word for my friends when you do bariatric surgery or high risk patient uh, limb peritoneum cases please talk to surgeon that uh, if there is apnea or there is de stabilization stabilization i will reduce the pressure and you have to shout patient is getting unstable i am reducing the pressure and this should be a uh, talk to the surgeon before surgery in cases of uh, problem he will not say i have 10 minutes 5 minutes you know give me 5 minutes so you can talk to him before and he should agree yes uh, you can reduce the pressure the uh, maintenance uh, anesthesia is always balance anesthesia mode of ventilation is controlled always in peds and geriatrics and obs in pediatric cases uh, we should use the control ventilation in geriatric we should use control ventilation in, in, in even obs patient we should use control ventilation we are using control ventilation everywhere but uh, this is very important and the the the, the, the problem is same uh, this uh, frc this is closing capacity which comes higher than actually this is next uh, extubation extubation after completion of surgery extubation should be delayed until neuromuscular blocking agents are completely reversed we should use uh, electric uh, sorry nerve stimulator Uh, NMP monitor in all cases of OP, and uh, the patient should be extubated fully. We know how much is the residual neuromuscular blockage. We can reverse it, and it's better to use sugamandates. Now the rate of sugamandates price is reduced. It should be available. Fully awake patient should be extubated. Adequate airway. He should maintain the adequate airway. He should maintain. He or she should maintain the adequate tidal volume. and we should keep the patient in upright position in recovery hdu pacu or icu and we always use some supplemental oxygen until he is clear of any severe effects post operative management in post operative care we use high fio2 50% is mandatory and depending on the saturation we can increase the fio2 keep patient in upright position to avoid the atelectasis cases vital sign monitoring with etco is very important we should use all the five monitors vital sign monitor but must include entire the carbon dioxide good analgesia using regional anesthesia avoiding long acting okay so we always use regional anesthesia technique for post operative anesthesia we should not use not avoid but we should not use morphine catheter we can use fentanyl Remy fentanyl and for these cases, fentanyl is available everywhere. Rapid metabolization, mobilization of the DVT pre- prevention. We should mobilize the patient every day, and even if he is not able to walk, we should move his head and leg, lower limbs when he has a power to move. And the use incentive as far as we see, to this is again a method of recruitment of algae. Physiotherapy may combine to decrease the risk of atrophy. So, gamma dex may be used in morbidly and super obese patient as a reversal or to reverse the residual neuromuscular block in PACO. Postoperative complications include respiratory failure, deep vein thrombosis can occur, pulmonary embolism can occur, in the late period wound infection can occur. Clinical parts for these obese patient are. optimization of medical condition early in the preoperative period this will facilitate a smooth perioperative period so the most important uh, period of uh, our anesthesia management that includes preop intraop postop we emphasize more on perioperative preparation optimization and optimization of core comorbidities and we should know we should prepare plan Uh, what gadgets are required? Everything should be available uh, in case of emergency. DVT prophylaxis is very important. 
in these cases you can use the pharmacological methods relaxation or whatever you the of the hospital protocol or we must use the the non pharmacological method uh, electrical stimulation of calf muscle or there are pneumatic uh, calf calf compressors uh ramping position is recommended in the general armies don't be smart i can do i can do i will do it. i have done hundreds always make a position short acting easily reversible agent should be used yes so we were discussing the clinical part this is the last slide uh long acting opiate should be avoided because of risk of adverse respiratory depression Uh, regional anesthesia has been proposed as a safer alternative to GA. However, with this, with ultrasound guided regional anesthesia, technically there may be technical difficulties. So, government may be used in more than every patient to reverse the neuromuscular block. Thank you very much.